on World News Tonight. Looming blackouts. Ukraine braces for winter following heavy damage dealt to power stations by Russian forces. Nationwide walkout. French protesters have authorities in hot waters with demands for better pay at the forefront. High stakes showdown. The United States prepares for midterms with Roe vs Wade in contentious debates. And Lego on wheels. A life-size Lego Lamborghini takes the spotlight in the Paris Auto Show. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. And our top story today still leads with the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Ukraine warned of an emerging critical risk to its electricity grid after multiple Russian airstrikes targeted energy facilities across the country, with President Vladimir Zelensky stating that Moscow's repeated bombardments had destroyed one-third of the country's power facilities as winter approaches. This has become a familiar sight for many in Ukraine. But the town of Zitomir isn't on the front line of the war. It's 500 kilometers to the west. The Kremlin's war machine has launched volleys of rockets across the country within the last week, striking critical infrastructure like energy substations. As it retaliates for the recent bombing of a bridge in Crimea, the message from Russia is clear. Nowhere is out of reach. Another kind of Russian terrorist attacks, targeting energy and critical infrastructure. Since October 10th, 30 percent of Ukraine's power stations have been destroyed, causing massive blackouts across the country. No space left for negotiations with Putin's regime. In the latest phase of Russia's offensive, thousands of Ukrainians prepare to face a freezing winter with limited or no access to water, electricity or heating. The strikes seemingly designed to test the steely resolve Ukrainians have shown in the first eight months of this war. Kamikaze drone strikes are also now being employed by the Kremlin. At least five people were killed in such strikes on Monday. Iran stands accused by Ukraine of supplying Russia with drones, a claim both Tehran and Moscow deny. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg on Tuesday confirmed the alliance would be providing Kyiv with air defense systems in the coming days to help repel such attacks. On the front line, fighting remains heavy in the south, the east and the northeastern Kharkiv region, with Kyiv's forces continuing their counteroffensive. On Tuesday, Russia claimed to have retaken territory within the region, its first such claim since its troops were pushed back at the end of the summer. Ukraine is signaling that it is seeking to sever diplomatic relations with Iran after what they say is Tehran's deeping, deepening military support for Russia. Meanwhile, Ukraine is set to officially request defense supplies from Israel. Ukraine's top diplomat says he has called on President Volodymyr Zelensky to cut the country's diplomatic ties with Iran. He explained that Tehran bears full responsibility for the destruction of their relations with Ukraine, taking into consideration the widespread destruction caused by Iran-made drones to the country's infrastructure, as well as human casualties. He then added that he has urged EU ministers to impose sanctions against Iran. We've never taken an anti-Iranian stance, but after Iran became part of aggressive crimes and Russian crimes on our territory, we are taking a definite and honest position. While Iran has denied supplying drones to Moscow, Iran-made so-called suicide drones were used in Russia's latest strikes against Ukraine. According to Ukrainian authorities, more than 70 people have been killed in the rocket and drone attacks since October 7th. They added that some 30 percent of the country's power stations had been destroyed in the past week or so. Parts of the capital city are without power and water following the latest strikes that took place on Tuesday. Meanwhile, Ukraine's foreign minister also explained Kyiv will send an official note to Israel requesting defense supplies. Today, Ukraine will send an official note to the government of Israel asking it to immediately deliver air defense systems and begin cooperation so that Ukraine receives the necessary equipment. While Israel has condemned Moscow's invasion of Ukraine and provided Kyiv with humanitarian relief, it has stopped short of also providing military support. 
Thousands of people took to the streets across France and commuters faced delays as unions staged a nationwide strike for higher salaries as they remain in deadlock with the government over walkouts at oil depots that have sparked fuel shortages. Thousands of transport workers, school teachers and medical staff across France took to the streets on Tuesday demanding higher wages to match rising inflation. After weeks of disruptive walkouts, the CGT union representing refinery workers at Total Energy's oil refineries rejected the company's offer of a 7% pay rise. Leading the protest, Secretary General Philippe Marines called for a 20% increase to minimum wage. What we are asking for is an increase in wages, an increase in minimum wage and the sliding scale of wages from the government. And then negotiation in these companies without delay to meet the demand of workers without waiting for a strike. Although there were no widespread disruptions to public transport, unions have warned more industrial action is coming. The strikes have become President Macron's biggest challenge yet since he was re-elected last May. Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne told protesters that it's unacceptable that a minority continues to block the country. In Paris, protesters clashed with riot police, resulting in 11 arrests. According to the Interior Minister, four people were arrested elsewhere and nine officers injured. And as protesters run through France, the EU has presented a budget cap in order to battle fluctuating energy prices in the bloc. The move is expected to better handle any shortages in the near future. The ongoing crisis as a result of soaring and unstable energy prices is still a huge problem for the European Union. Ahead of winter, the EU is proposing a new set of measures aimed at reducing the cost for citizens and companies. One of them is to reduce price volatility on the main index used to set gas prices, the Title Transfer Facility, or TTF. The element that we are now putting on the table is uh, the market correction mechanism. So, uh, again, to take out the speculation and the volatility of the TTF market benchmark, um, that is no more representative. And this will have a taming effect on um, the prices, the gas prices that are traded in the European Union. This mechanism will establish a dynamic price limit for transactions on the TTF benchmark. In the medium term, Brussels also wants to create a benchmark only for liquefied natural gas to complement the one used until now, the TTF, which the Commission says is no longer reflecting the market situation. In addition, and to protect supply and price, the EU wants to make it mandatory for Member States to buy at least 15% of their gas for storage through a joint purchase to avoid outbidding each other. At the same time, the Commission also wants to increase energy solidarity among countries in the EU to avoid shortages during this winter. For now, there are only six solidarity agreements in place, but the EU wants this number to rise to around 40 through default solidarity rules within the treaties. And after several months of facing pressure from EU governments, the Commission says it's now ready to start a debate for other proposals, like the introduction of the so-called Iberian exception, which caps the price of gas used to produce electricity, available only for Spain and Portugal, but potentially brought to an EU level something the Commission was reluctant to examine for several months. The proposals and other ideas, like a cap on gas prices, will be discussed by EU leaders at a meeting at the end of the week. As the United States anticipate the upcoming midterms, President Joe Biden is rallying for the democratic message at the forefront of which is abortion rights. However, there are concerns that the issue is losing steam among the American public. With just three weeks until the midterms and Republicans slamming Democrats over the economy and record inflation, President Biden tonight trying to amplify the politically divisive issue of abortion rights, urging voters to keep Democrats in control of Congress. Here's the promise I make to you and the American people. The first bill that I will send to the Congress will be to codify Roe v. Wade. But some Democrats fear the potency of that message may be waning. Tonight, a new poll shows 44 percent of likely voters cite the economy or inflation as the number one problem facing the country, while just 5 percent list abortion as their top issue. And now Republicans have a four-point lead when voters are asked which party's candidate they'd support. 
In Ohio, one of several crucial races that will determine control of the Senate, Republican candidate J.D. Vance hammered Democrat Tim Ryan over skyrocketing prices in a heated final debate. That rising energy price that people see at the pump, that they see in the utility bills, that was the direct result of policies enacted by Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and supported 100 percent by Tim Ryan. While Ryan slammed Vance for embracing former President Trump. You were calling Trump America's Hitler. Then you kissed his ass. It's not true. It is true. And then you kissed his ass and then he endorsed you. And you said he's the greatest president of all time. There are critical governor's races, too, in the battlegrounds of Arizona and Michigan and a rematch in Georgia between Republican Governor Brian Kemp and Democrat Stacey Abrams. Their one and only showdown last night. We live in a state of fear. And this is a governor who, for the last four years, has beat his chest but delivered very little for most Georgians. Kemp touting his early moves to reopen the state during the pandemic and going after Abrams. Miss Abrams is going to lie about my record because she doesn't want to talk about her own. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, there is yet another North Korean provocation as Pyongyang fired hundreds of artillery shells into maritime buffer zones separating the two Koreas. South Korea's military strongly condemned the latest military activity, calling it a clear violation of the September 19th military agreement. North Korea fired artillery rounds that landed near a sea border between the two Koreas late on Tuesday. According to the South Joint Chief of Staff on Wednesday, Pyongyang fired some 100 shells into the West Sea from around 10 p.m. Tuesday. Another 150 rounds were fired into the East Sea an hour later. This move comes amid recent increased military action by the regime and only four days after their provocation last Friday. The JCS explained that the shells did not land in South Korea's territorial waters, but rather in maritime buffer zones. Those boundaries have been set up to ease military tension along the two Korea's border areas. The South Korean military called Pyongyang's string of provocations a clear violation of the September 19th military agreement, signed in 2018 in an effort to build trust between the neighbors and press stop to hostile military activity. The JCS urged the regime to halt actions that undermine the peace and stability of the Korean peninsula, as well as the international community. Meanwhile, Seoul said it is closely monitoring the North in coordination with the United States. North Korea's latest military action came just a day after South Korean troops began their annual 12-day hukuk exercise on Monday, which has an unspecified number of U.S. troops taking part this year. Since late last month, North Korea has conducted an array of short- and long-range missile and artillery launches. Pundits say this can be largely seen as an attempt by the regime to expand its weapons arsenal and gain leverage in future negotiations with its rivals. French cement maker Lafarge pleaded guilty to a U.S. charge that it made payments to groups designated as terrorists by the United States, including the Islamic State group, agreeing to pay almost $780 million in fines and for forfeitures. One of the world's largest corporations admitting tonight it funneled millions of dollars to ISIS. Corporate crime that has reached a new low and a very dark place. French cement company Lafarge, which operates plants in dozens of countries and 43 U.S. states, pleading guilty to paying terrorists in Syria between 2013 and 2014, so it could keep a cement plant running as ISIS and other groups fought for control. Payments made at the same time the terror group was capturing and beheading U.S. hostages, including James Foley and Stephen Sotloff. Prosecutors say the company sent ISIS and the Al-Qaeda-linked Nusra Front more than $10 million, then tried to cover it up. Lafarge made a deal with the devil. Foreign terrorists who pledged to and in fact did harm the United States, its people, and its national security. The company agreeing to pay a settlement of nearly $800 million to the U.S. government. French authorities in 2018 charged eight former Lafarge executives with financing terrorism. 
The company, now owned by a Swiss firm, said today it deeply regretted what happened, adding that the executives involved no longer work there and that none of the conduct involved U.S. employees. Conditions in Somalia have gone from bad to worse as it is now estimated that there is a child being admitted per minute to a hospital due to severe malnutrition. Organizations such as UNICEF are concerned that the situation can continue to further worsen if left unchecked. One child every minute is admitted to a health facility in Somalia to be treated for severe acute malnutrition. The United Nations Children's Agency has said. UNICEF spokesperson James Elder said the country was now at risk of child deaths on a scale not seen in decades. He told a briefing that the latest admission rates showed that 44,000 children were admitted to health facilities in August. So it's one per minute. That's a child whose mother has walked for days to get her help, a child who's fighting to survive, a child whose life, of course, hangs in the balance. Elder said the situation already looks worse now than in 2011, when famine killed more than 250,000 people in Somalia. In early September, the UN warned that two districts were projected to face famine between October and December, and that more than half a million of Somalia's children are at risk of dying from malnutrition. Things are bad and every sign indicates that they are going to get worse. So without greater action, without greater investment, we are facing the death of children on a scale not seen in half a century. The Horn of Africa is suffering its worst drought in 40 years after the last four rainy seasons failed. Elder said the fifth rainy season looks grim. The situation in Somalia is exacerbated by attacks by Al-Shabaab militants and high global food prices. Major flooding in Nigeria is leaving gas producers in the region with no options but force measure. The country's struggling economy is at risk of falling even further due to the possibility of liquefaction. Nigerian liquefied natural gas company Nigeria LNG Limited has declared force majeure, signalling that it may not be able to meet contractual obligations after widespread flooding disrupted gas supplies. It's a move that could spell danger for the country's already struggling economy and will likely slow gas supply to Europe as it struggles to replace Russian exports following the invasion of Ukraine. Portugal's oil and gas company Galp Energia admitted it could now face additional sourcing disruptions. The announcement comes as rampant theft of Nigeria's crude oil saw export levels slump to their lowest in 40 years. Lagos relies on fossil fuel exports for 90% of its foreign exchange and around half of its budget. Officials have warned that disruptions could continue into November. Welcome back to World News tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Rolls-Royce has unveiled its first electric car. The curtain was lifted on the new vehicle called the Spectre. The car took some 11 years to design and build. The biggest jump in food prices since 1980 pushed British inflation back into double digits last month, matching a 40-year high hit in July in a new blow of households grappling with the cost of living crisis. An Iranian rock climber who competed in the international contest without a headscarf said that she had done it unintentionally. It comes after she was widely assumed to have expressed support for protests in Iran. Forces from Ethiopia's northern Tigray region conceded that they had lost control of the populous town of Shire to federal military and its allies. Netflix enjoyed a turnaround in fortunes in the third quarter, reversing a deadline in subscribers in the first half of 2022. According to its Q3 earnings report, Netflix added that 2.4 million subscribers almost double market expectations.
And that is all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with visuals of a life-size Lego Lamborghini that was unveiled at the Paris Auto Show. The supercar has the exact same dimensions as the real one and it is comprised of a whopping 400,000 pieces. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.